Let's face it, y'all. Rockets, they kind of suck. They used a lot of fuel to get a handful of people and a bit of cargo about 400 kilometers. Look, I'm not saying that rockets are bad. I'm saying we should be doing so much better. We don't need rockets. We need the next thing. So let's talk about that. Hey everyone, Trace here. Thanks for watching Uno Dose of Trace. This is episode two of five on leaving Earth. Today we're gonna to talk about how to leave because yesterday we talked about why and tomorrow where. So subscribe for all the episodes. We're gonna get into some engineering and some rocketry and I'm really excited. So let's kick into it. Rockets are old, like really old, like super old technology. Most people think, oh, the rocket, that was the World War II, right? The V2, and that was used to bomb London, and then we took those German scientists and we invented the Apollo program and we went to the moon, easy peasy. But the first rocket was not actually invented in the 1940s. It wasn't by Germans or Russians, but by the Greeks. It was built in 400 BCE by a mathematician named Archytas. The story was then written down by a Roman named Argus Gellius. It was a wooden bird that was aerodynamic, and inside the bird was a little bladder, probably actually an animal's bladder, and it was attached to like a pole, an arrow. Using fire, Archytas heated water inside of a metal ball, and then eventually would release it. The escaping steam from the ball would work as a propellant, just like that anime Steam Boy, which is super cool, and it is not a rocket in the way that you're thinking, but like a rudimentary rocket. The steam propelled the bird and made this beautiful, amazing display that awed and shocked people in 400 BCE. The first rocket rocket was invented in 1100 CE in China. They use solid fuel rockets, like gunpowder essentially, and it's used for fireworks and weapons, and it was continued along that path until the 20th century. And that is when we think of rockets, right? The Germans and the war and blah, blah, blah. blah. Rockets came into their own though on October 4th of 1957. We realized what they could be. They weren't just weapons, they were something different. They were a breakthrough technology. The Soviet Union launched Sputnik and everyone who had a radio tuned to the right frequency heard that little beep, 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 beep as it flew over their heads all around the planet. They launched it on an R-7 ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile. It was a weapon, but they used it in a different way. Basically, this missile from World War II was powerful enough to push a payload so fast and so high that it fell around the curvature of the Earth. That is what orbiting is. It's sort of like you're falling, but you're going so fast forward that the Earth curves away from you underneath. And this is what we still do. This is what the International Space Station does. It's what the space shuttles do. That is how orbiting works. We literally did it again this week. SpaceX's Falcon took off and took two astronauts to the International Space Station. It was considered an affordable mission. SpaceX, according to their data, launches for roughly $55 million per person. That's affordable. They have a famously reusable rocket stack. If you do the math there, that's about $180,000 per pound of human. How many pounds of human could you trade your house for if you own a house? The space shuttle was even bigger, could carry more stuff, but that big orange fuel tank that is so recognizable on the space shuttle, that's a one-time use thing. You had to make a new one for every rocket. So that meant 135 new tanks, and each shuttle launch cost $450 million. And this is the problem with rockets and why I'm saying they're bad. I'm not saying that they're bad like we shouldn't use them, I'm saying we need a breakthrough technology. In the way that rockets were a breakthrough technology that allowed us to go to space, we need a new breakthrough technology that allows us to go even further. Chemical rockets have been around. They've been around for thousands of years. We pretty much peaked at making rockets as efficient as we can. I mean, even the shuttle engines were over 99% efficient at burning their fuel, and maybe we can do better. But after a century or two centuries or five centuries of work, we need something new. There are other plans. So if the goal is to get to space, that's the Kármán line, 100 kilometers up above our heads, the imaginary line where jet engines don't work anymore and you need rocket engines. So if we need this technology, this is what we need to solve. We need the jet, to burn the fuel in the atmosphere mix. So here's how it works. Jets burn fuel and atmosphere and mix them together to create thrust. Rocket propellant creates everything to make the thrust and burn it without needing extra air. 
So what we really need is a breakthrough technology. And the thing about rockets is there was a lot of money in rocketry in the early 20th century. And because of that, we were able to try all sorts of things. There were lots of different minds trying and working on stuff. So you think, oh, well, if the atmosphere is thicker, close to the ground, 99% of the atmosphere is you know, gone if you can get up in the air. So why not put a rocket on a balloon? They did that, 1949, it's called a raccoon. Raccoons take little teeny sounding rockets and move them above a majority of the atmosphere so they need less fuel at that point. From there, they shoot off of the balloon and they can go wherever you need them to. It was used for high altitude atmospheric science. They don't have huge payloads, the balloons need to be real big and they can't carry people which is too bad. But that doesn't mean that there are not people trying it. There is a company called Leo Aerospace that's working on it. That's the kind of fanciest one I found, although they had a lot of coverage in 2019, which was last year. They haven't actually launched anything yet, it doesn't seem. At least I can't really tell from their website. So still a lot to go on that. Another project, which I think is really cool, is the Skylon project. It flies like an airplane in the atmosphere, their rocket engine, but once it passes the Kármán line and runs out of atmosphere to mix with the fuel, it adds adds onboard liquid oxygen into the engines. It's called a Synergetic Air Breathing Rocket Engine, or a Saber, and it's from Reaction Engines, Inc. And it's super cool, but it's not there yet. And on top of that, you have to carry all of that liquid oxygen with you, which adds to the weight, which adds to the requirement of the rocket to be able to go anywhere and reduces the amount of cargo that you can carry. That said, this is still cooler in some ways than sticking everything on top of a missile like we've been doing for almost 100 years. In my opinion though, the best plan is to eschew chemical rockets and balloons and combinations of jets and rockets because all of that is taking old technology and smooshing it together in order to make something that does one thing better than another thing, right? It's, it's not the best. The best plan I think is something completely new, the space elevator. Think about it. Think about a tower that extends from the surface of the planet all the way to space. Not like a tall building, but think of like a yo-yo on the end of a string. And this works because the yo-yo is light and the string is strong. And now imagine a school bus or two on the end of a 150 kilometer string spinning at 1600 kilometers per hour. That's the rotation speed of the earth. And thanks to space exploration, we know that satellites and space stations can work and they'll stay up there, but the cable the string, that's the trouble. We cannot make a cable strong enough. Yeah. The one thing that we do know of thus far that's strong enough is single crystal graphene. Graphene is an atomic carbon in a sheet. It's literally one atom thick, and if you roll it into a tube, you get carbon nanotubes, which maybe you've heard of if you've been around science for the last 20 years or so. It's got a tensile strength, this single crystal carbon, of 1300 gigapascals. That's very strong. It's the strongest material ever tested. The problem is we can only make a few grams at a time. We're gonna need more than a few grams to make a cable that is hundreds of kilometers long and we are not there yet. We need a breakthrough technology. We need you to go into STEM and go and learn about how to do engineering and physics and space and all sorts of cool stuff and invent it. We need you. Until we can move people off of the earth for less than hundreds of thousands of dollars per kilogram, for less than a Midwestern house for every pound of human, we're stuck here in this cradle, trapped in the terrarium that is spaceship earth. And since we're trapped here, we should take care of each other, I think. And the easiest way to do that, I mean, seriously, the easiest way is to just open a new tab. That's it, boop, open that tab. Open tabs to donate to charity using Tab for a Cause. Tab for a Cause is a browser extension that donates to charity each time you open a new tab, which let's face it, we do constantly. Download the extension with this link, it's in the description too, and it benefits people in need and of course supports the making of Uno Dose of Trace just a little bit. Once you've installed it, just browse the web like normal. Every time you open a tab, it donates a little money to Tab for a Cause. It is so simple, that brief keystroke for you translates to real money for charity. And that real money does make a real difference to real people. As of this recording, Tabbers have raised over $900,000 for charity already. That's like a million buckazoids almost. Tab for a Cause charities help families get fresh water, they help educate young people, and they give money directly to families in need, which research shows can help them raise themselves out of poverty. Get the Chrome extension with this link, you'll be able to get charitable in just a few seconds. Think of all the tabs that you've opened in all of your life without anyone getting a benefit. It seems crazy now, right? Thanks for being a good human. 
let's, you know, go back to Spaceship Earth and Isaac Asimov. So Asimov says in an interview in 1975 that lunar cities are common in science fiction, but a city just floating out in space, uh, a space station by itself in what's called free space, unheard of. Do you anticipate anything like this in any of your science fiction? Nobody did really, because we've all been planet chauvinists. We've all believed people <laughs> should live on the surface of a planet. The closest I came to a manufactured world in free space was to suggest that we go out to the asteroid belt and hollow out the asteroids and make ships out of them. It never occurred to me to bring the material from the asteroids in towards the Earth where conditions are pleasanter. I love this interview. I highly recommend you check it out. This sci-fi author and this physicist spent an incredible 30 minutes talking about all the villages and cities that we could build in space and control the day-night cycle and spin to give it gravity and grow plants for food and atmosphere. It would be free of pesticides because there'd be no pests. It'd be free of plant diseases because we'd be able to look at their DNA and know if they have any. But this is all predicated, of course, on going to space and doing it with something that can lift more than a few pounds at a time. I would love to be part of that conversation personally, but for now, it's just a conversation. We need to make it real. Maybe private space flight will change that. Maybe private commercial companies can find a way to make this more affordable, to lift things to low Earth orbit, and from low Earth orbit, we can get to the moon. But we need a breakthrough technology to do that. So let's talk a bit about the moon. Let's talk a bit about Mars. If we can get off this planet and get to other planets, that would be a breakthrough technology, or at least help us fuel more. Because we can use the resources on the moon or on Mars to go further into space, and we can do the same thing with asteroids and other planets along the way. But the journey of a thousand miles, it begins with that single launch. Right now, we're kind of toddling around, falling back to Earth and landing on our butts every time, hoping that eventually we will find a way to get up there and stay. And once we do, where do we go? We've left the nest, we've left the crib. Where do we fly next? Where do we toddle? Next time, we'll talk a bit more about that. So stick around, subscribe so you get all five of the episodes in this series. If you didn't watch the episode before, go back and watch that one. Special thanks again to Tab for a Cause for sponsoring this episode, and thanks to you for watching it. I am Trace, thanks again, and I will see you in the future.